Today, we're finally diving into the brand new Blackmagic Micro Studio Camera 4K G2. Long name, amazing results. I, for one, have been very excited about this camera ever since it was announced at IBC back in September 2023. And having been a fan and user of the original micros, albeit the cinema camera iteration, it's exciting to see Blackmagic return to the form. And FYI, this review is actually being shot on a Micro G2 with the audio running directly into the camera. So what you're seeing and hearing is exactly what you're gonna get with this amazing little camera. Also, all B-roll showing the camera itself were also shot with a second G2 just to give you a bit more material to base your opinions off of. So with that, let's dive into it. Now, admittedly, a lot of this review is gonna sound like a defense of the G2, and that's because I'm very familiar with the issues a lot of people, most of whom have never used it, have pointed out upon its release. Now, in the right hands, I truly believe this is one of the best all-around cameras currently on the market, especially for the price point of under $1,000. Now, while it might not be the best option in any one specific area of use, its sheer versatility gives you an ocean of options on how you can use it in a way that suits you best on any given day. Plus, there are some hacks I've discovered that really open up the usability of this camera for the average videographer, so stick around for that. Now, this camera scratches the itch for a lot of different users out there. First being filmmakers who are fans of the original micros and have been wanting to see an update to this little guy, as well as those who've been clamoring for Blackmagic to release a quote-unquote box camera and are finally getting their ask, although they may not know it yet, and last but not least, the broadcasters and streamers out there who've been needing a small form factor 4K broadcast camera after losing the Studio G1. Now admittedly, while I do have a background in broadcast, I am far from a broadcast engineer, so while I will touch on the use capabilities of this in a broadcast setting, I'm not really in a position to speak on areas like REST API, Ethernet tethering, and so on, so just a heads up there. So somehow this little camera really flew under the radar for a lot of potential users when it was announced back in September partially because so much focus was thrown on the new 6K camera, but also because of the studio portion of this camera's name. Blackmagic does operate in two worlds, broadcast and production. So when a lot of the production folks hear studio, they generally think it isn't something for them. And what the G2 manages to do, much like the Ursa broadcast G2, is open the doors to let this camera live in both worlds. Now, when the original Micro first came out in 2016, we had both studio and cinema iterations of the camera. The cinema version only offered 1080p HD, but could record internally where the G1 Studio, while it had 4K, could only record off of the HDMI or SDI output signals. There wasn't even a record button on that camera. Now, the G2 is sort of a marriage of both of these, offering that 4K with professional broadcast settings and connections, while also giving it the ability to record flat b -roll albeit the USB-C connections to an SSD drive. And while it doesn't offer internal recording, this is still vastly preferable in my eyes to capturing the video signal off of the outputs as we had in the Studio G1. According to Blackmagic, they really do want this camera to service both worlds, broadcast and cinema, even though it bears the studio name. So just how good is the new Micro G2 and is it right for you? Well, first, let's talk about general ergonomics and overall use. The first thing people tend to point out about this camera is the menu system. Now, if you're coming from or have experience with earlier versions of the Micro, I'm happy to say that the menu navigation of this camera is much, much easier than the original. However, if you're coming from the Pocket 4K, 6K, or Ursa, it is a somewhat familiar layout, but with a much different way of navigating it, and it will take some getting used to, largely because of the button interface. Now, I did a video a while back with a full menu overview. Please reference that for a more in-depth analysis, but understand that, again, if you are familiar with Blackmagic's base heads-up display menu options, just know that the most important elements are right there in a familiar space and quickly accessible on the G2. Now, the deeper menu items are a bit more of a new look, but easy enough to access with a bit of time using the camera. And again, it is much, much easier than earlier models of the Micro. Now, another thing to know right now, the camera does not have Bluetooth. So if you were hoping to simply skip the menu navigation altogether by using the Blackmagic app, that is not presently an option, nor can you control the settings through a video assist. Now, maybe things will change in the future, but for now, the front door is the only way to enter when it comes to menus. But before you get too upset, I really, really want you to think about one thing. 
how often are you actually changing your camera settings on a shoot? If your goal is a consistent image, the best thing you can do is set it and forget it. Control your light ahead of the sensor with filters, and you should strive to lock off your ISO, your shutter at 180, frame rate, color temp, none of these elements should really change within a setting. Now, if you are changing filming environments, you'll likely have enough time to make adjustments. Now, beyond that, considering that this camera only shoots B-RAW, you can always fine tune your ISO and color temp later on. And when it comes to switching from real time to slow motion, that is four button clicks away to toggle on and off. And to me, that really is the only setting you might need to adjust quickly on the fly when filming. And Blackmagic has made it relatively fast and easy. Now stick around because even though I just spent the last few minutes defending this menu navigation, there is a hack that I discovered for this camera that might solve any and all issues some of you may have with what I just said. More on that in a minute. Now presently, the camera only shoots B-RAW. And I think that's totally fine. I only shoot RAW anyway, and I honestly don't understand why you would choose ProRes over RAW to begin with. You have a lot more flexibility in post, it's a better format, and it also uses a lot less space on your media. Most levels of ProRes in 4K are still larger than most levels of 4K in B-RAW. Now why did Blackmagic do this? Likely cost. To include ProRes, they have to pay a licensing fee to Apple, and if most users aren't shooting ProRes anyway, excluding it allows Blackmagic to keep the price of the camera low. Now, an argument, of course, for ProRes might be that an editor somewhere down the line is unfamiliar with B-RAW or isn't using Resolve. Well, B-RAW can be edited directly in Premiere with a few plugins added. Plus, I honestly have never met an editor unfamiliar with the B-RAW format, and five minutes on YouTube will bring them up to speed. So really, I don't see this as an excuse. Now with that, 4K or UHD to be more precise, is the only resolution option when recording directly to your media. There's no DCI, no 2K or HD, and of course no window censoring. Now if you really do need HD for broadcasting or for streaming, you can output via the HDMI or the SDI in HD. And the SDI signal can be changed from UHD to 1080p and even 1080i which is very important for those broadcast situations. Now, all this to say, if you really need HD or even ProRes, you can definitely record that externally, which really isn't a big deal because the camera has to be connected to a monitor anyway for most non-remote shooting scenarios. Which brings us to the physical ergonomics of the G2. Now, this camera obviously needs some sort of rigging to make much use of it. First and foremost being a screen, since it clearly doesn't have one. Now, if you can swing it, I highly recommend using the Blackmagic Video Assist with this camera as your monitor. You don't necessarily need the 12G HDR iteration, but a Video Assist will offer a lot of extras when it comes to using the G2. Now, sure, Video Assists are a bit pricey, but they can be found used on eBay at an affordable price if you're in a pinch. Now I'll talk more about how the video assist comes into play in just a minute. The next is some way to hold it better since this baseball sized camera really doesn't have any grip to it. Now this will probably require a cage, but once it is in a cage, the options to build this out are endless. After that, a way to mount the SSD to the body for recording is necessary. And again, a cage will help here, but as you can see, it is not fully required with the right SSD holder. Now surprisingly enough, the camera may not necessarily require the typical external battery solution we've come to rely on with most Blackmagic cameras. Because of the lack of a screen, the native batteries actually last surprisingly long on the G2, which again isn't typical for Blackmagic. Yes, external batteries like a V-mount or an MPF will give you hours of usage, but I did find that with the native Canon style LPE6 battery, I could get almost an hour of runtime per battery. And that is your most basic setup outside of a studio. Now, it doesn't look like much, and it isn't much, but that is the true brilliance of the G2 and why this really is the box camera everyone has been asking for. You can truly make it as big or as small as you want. With the right accessories, it's a full cinema rig or a bare bones action cam or a videographer's run and gun dream, or you can throw it on a gimbal or a drone or leave it in the studio, stream with it, make it your modular ENG news camera for when you're in the field and have to travel light. This is the camera for any and all scenarios depending on how you build it. And while you could technically say that about any camera, because of the low price point, size, and simplicity of the G2 in its most basic state, it makes more sense than most others. And if you really want one camera to cover all bases, this is it. The lens mount is Micro Four Thirds, which I love because you can put just about any lens available onto it, from EF to PL to vintage glass and beyond. 
Now a speed booster will help you adapt if your EF glass isn't wide enough for the MFT sensor, which does have a two times crop. But beyond that, native Micro Four Thirds glass has become extremely affordable in the last few years as more and more systems have moved to Super 35 and full frame. Now in the past, it used to be tricky to get good wide angle lenses given the two times crop, but that isn't really the case anymore with some of the ultra wide zero distortion lenses out there from Laowa and Miki. The Laowa 7.5 F2 is an incredibly fast wide angle lens that will yield a 14 millimeter full frame field of view equivalent with plenty of light getting onto your sensor and it can be had for a couple hundred bucks on eBay. Now, when it comes to Cineprimes, again, the Miki Micro Four Thirds Cineprimes are extremely affordable, even when purchased new and used, you could get a full set of six lenses for under 1500 bucks. And I do have to say that these lenses are incredible in their quality. Now, I can't stress this enough. Good glass is often the most expensive, yet most important aspect of filmmaking. A quality lens on a low quality camera will outshine a garbage lens on an Alexa. And those are just the facts. Getting good glass on this camera is easy, it's affordable, and can make all the difference depending on your use. Now, why choose this camera over the Pocket 4K, if at all? The Pocket 4K is very similar in price and features, just 300 bucks more. It's obviously 4K, albeit with more options for resolution and formats, and also featuring a Micro Four Thirds mount and sensor. The exact same sensor, actually. And to be honest, the image quality is the exact same. There really is no difference in the image between these two cameras. And there are some perks to the Pocket. It shoots a wider variety of media, already has a screen attached to it. It's a bit easier to navigate the menus and operate in a bare naked state. So why choose one over the other? Well, that 100% comes down to how you see yourself using the camera. Honestly, and with the assistance of the Pocket 4K battery grip, if all you plan to do is use the Pocket in a simple stripped down state like this, shooting casually handheld, maybe for travel film type setting, the Pocket makes more sense practically and financially compared to what it takes to make the micro work in a similar setup. However, the second you decide to do anything else with the Pocket, its advantages start to vanish quickly. Honestly, I almost never see the Pocket use this strip down, and the average shooter does seem to fully rig out their Pocket, which not only drives up the price, but also makes it less practical in the built-out sense. Adding a cage, monitor, maybe some rails, top handle, side handle, big battery. Now you have a much bigger footprint than a fully built-out Micro, and again, let's be honest, 95% of builds I see tend to look like this. So where and how does the Micro distinguish itself? Well, obviously in its marketed form as a studio and streaming camera where it occupies very little space, packs a punch and meets all the needs of broadcast standards. Its size also lends itself to simply mounting it somewhere on a desk or for streamers to put atop their monitors. Obviously esports events, concert rigs, all those come into play. A step past that, the low profile of the G2 makes it ideal for product videography. You can get extremely close to your subject without casting a shadow, making it a lot easier to light your scene. A strip down the G2 can also fit very comfortably on a roller skate style tabletop dolly, and that smaller sensor makes it ideal for keeping a deeper depth of field, which is again very important for product videography. Next, it kills as an action cam. Take a look. Apart from the size and low price, in case anything goes truly wrong, the absence of a screen is actually its strength here, since many cameras can become obsolete once that screen is damaged. Now, that isn't even a risk here, so regardless of impact or debris, that worry is voided. As far as setting a shot without a screen, you can easily just plug in the monitor, set the shot, and pull it away when you're ready to film, and that red tally light will let you know if you're recording or not, even without a screen in place. And again, the lightweight and size make it very easy to mount just about anywhere with very little rigging. And of course, the quality is stunning. Now, if you weren't impressed by my sweet 93 Taurus, here's a look at the camera inside a Mercedes-Benz race car at the Rolex 24-hour race in Daytona, Florida. Compliments of my friends over at Corsa Works. Check them out. 
Now this use at Daytona shows the camera's extreme ability to withstand stress. The camera team was obviously not allowed to touch the camera once the race started, so the camera was powering off of the car, recording to a four terabyte SSD in B-RAW 8 to 1. The camera ran for 24 hours straight without a drop frame or shutting down due to heat, and the average temperature inside that race cart was 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 48 degrees Celsius. Now the stiff suspension of a race car also means that the G2 was feeling every single vibration of that car, and it stood up to that test as well. Now, speaking of vibration, the camera also has gyro stabilization, which helps mitigate the vibration of a car or other issues brought about from handheld work. And this also means that the G2, especially with its size again, makes it a great option for lower payload Cinna and FPV drones. Now, there are many people out there already taking advantage of this. And again, to clarify, the camera does record gyro data for post-work stabilization. Just be sure that you have updated Resolve to the latest version to ensure that it's accessible by the software. Now this is probably the part of the video where people will start asking about rolling shutter. For the spec obsessed people out there, it comes in at about 16.22 milliseconds, which isn't bad. The new 6K full frame is 20 milliseconds at an open gate mode and 15 milliseconds in 4K DCI. So comparing UHD to 4K between these two, the micro is only slightly lagging. Now the Pocket 6K Pro is also just under 20 milliseconds in 6K. Now I for one don't care too much about this. I don't know who's out there whipping their camera all over the place like you see in a lot of these tests. And when it comes to moving objects like trains, there are of course other fixes. And also let's just be honest here, gang, it really only is camera geeks that see this stuff. The average viewer of any video material you're putting out has no idea if rolling shutter is even present. So it ain't bad with this camera and besides that, whatever. Just learn to shoot better, I guess. And moving on, and as we discussed, this can easily be built out for basic run and gun videography, slap on some handles, an external battery if needed, but again, the onboard battery is actually pretty good. But if you are gonna use an MPF or V-mount, it will power you all day long. Now, if you're into gimbals, the G2 shape will mount and balance perfectly and easily on just about any gimbal. Yes, getting to that record button might be a bit of an issue, but I have a solution for that that again, I'll get to in just a minute. Of course, as we said at the top, Blackmagic built this iteration to sort of merge those two older versions of the micro. So with some more rigging, the camera is clearly ready to work as a cinema camera on set. Now I had hoped to get some quality on set environment footage to show you here, but I didn't have an opportunity yet. So keep an eye out for that in the future. But again, given that this image is identical to the Pocket 4K, which has long proven its image quality to thrive in a cinematic setting, you can trust that it will work out well. Now beyond that, the box build that everyone's been wanting anyway, makes this a very practical and modular option for set work. Lastly, this camera could even work as an extremely compact ENG field camera. Much of what you might use to make this a built out studio camera can also work outside the studio once you're running in some extra power. Certain lenses can be controlled with remote accessories and the SDI means you can run it into a live view for direct broadcast back to master control. Now, is this the best field cam option? Maybe not but it does have everything you need and I will discuss that more in a future video talking about using this as an ENG field unit. In low light, the G2 is as good or maybe even better than the Pocket 4K, although that's not a scientific observation, but it is the same sensor and has some newer internals. I personally think the camera is great in low light, although some out there may disagree because of their expectation of a camera to see in the dark. Of course, if you push it too far, things will fall apart a little, post workflows can help, but also remember that sometimes it's good to just let the camera be true to what your eye is seeing. Sometimes it's best to let dark be dark, and if you really want to avoid noise, keep those shadows black. But for the sake of this review, I will say that the camera performs quite well in low lit environments, definitely much better than the original micros some of us are used to. So in short, as far as using this camera, the amount of options you have are astounding. Whatever way you decide to rig it, it tends to be much more practical than any of the pocket line cameras. And it's obviously a lot smaller and cheaper than an Ursa. So for a thousand bucks, plus a few hundred more for auxiliary options, you'll find yourself with a camera that can cover you in just about any situation. Now, as much as I clearly like this camera, it's not without its shortcomings, as I'm sure many people will point out. However, most of these can be overcome, so I wanna take a moment to discuss the problems that some people point out with the G2, and also share with you the fixes I have found to overcome most of them. 
Now the first issue some people will point out is the lack of clip playback. Now I for one obviously don't play back every single clip when shooting, but I definitely understand the importance of this, especially when filming difficult setups and especially for client work when the client is on set and wants playback. And the good news is you can work around this issue by using either the Blackmagic Video Assist, as I mentioned earlier, or the Atomos Ninja as your monitor. Both of these function as external recording units as well as monitors. And since the external screen is so necessary for this camera, it's really just a matter of being sure you have one of these options to make it work. All you have to do to get playback is set up the Video Assist or Ninja to record off of the HDMI or SDI signal. Now this recording will trigger at the exact moment the record button is pressed and you will get a sort of a proxy recording off of what's being recorded to the SSD. For playback, you simply play back what the monitor recorded to its own internal media. Very simple, very easy fix. Now there are some limitations here. For instance, if you're recording in high frame rate or slow motion, the clip will play back in real time 60p and not slowed down. Also, unless you're sending a clean feed to the video assist, things like your zebras, focus assist lines, and heads up display will be burned into the recorded proxy. Of course, you can send a clean feed and just use the zebras and focus assist off of your monitor to keep a clean recording, but you will not be able to have the menu indicators visible if you do have to make an adjustment. Again, not a big deal as you like aren't changing settings that much while filming, but that aside, I have found a way to quickly and easily toggle on and off a clean feed without having to open up your menu. Which brings me to this. This is Blackmagic's Zoom Demand handle, which changes a lot as far as the usability issues that many will have with the G2. Now this was designed strictly for studio use, but I've come to find that it can actually be used in the field as well. And while it's a big, bulky, and pricey thing at about 250 bucks brand new, I grabbed this one off of eBay for $160, and my hope is that Blackmagic will build off of this because what it allows you to do when paired with the micro is assign functions to the various buttons on this handle. Now the zoom demand handle is powered by the camera's USB-C port and it's not much of a battery drain at all. When rigged to the cage in place of a normal handle, it also puts the record button right in front of your thumb, which is awesome and saving you the hassle of having to constantly reach and find that record button. And this is especially useful if you're running off of a gimbal. Now the dial right here can be programmed to either adjust focus or iris. The different side buttons can be programmed to toggle on and off a clean feed for the HDMI. So if you are needing cleaner proxies off of the video assist, but still need to access the heads up display while filming to change your settings, this will allow you to quickly and easily turn on that clean feed without opening up the menu. You can also assign buttons for autofocus. Yes, you heard that correctly. Now this isn't continuous autofocus, but if you have an autofocus lens on the camera and need a sudden reset, you can quickly throw the focus with the touch of a button. And if you do have a lens with electronic zoom control, the rocker will allow you to control that, although there are only about four lenses on the market which are compatible with that feature. So in all, there are four programmable buttons on this, as well as the dial that I mentioned, and those can all be accessed and mapped under the zoom demand settings in the deeper menu. Now, right now, most of those functions are largely dedicated to a more studio type setting, but it wouldn't take a whole lot for Blackmagic to add more function options like turning on and off false color, focus peaking, high frame rate, or make the dial program to change color temperature and ISO. But what I really hope Blackmagic does is make a new handle that is a little bit smaller, but has the same internals and gives us those additional function settings. Now I have spoken to Blackmagic about this. I don't expect them to listen to me whatsoever, but the idea is out there. So let's see what happens because that could easily throw the doors wide open for this camera. Even if they don't, this handle, it might make a great accessory for the average shooter to consider. And I know for me, it's been great and it's lived on my rig ever since I discovered it. Now, before you come at me in the comments claiming that if the handle is plugged into the camera's USB port, you can't record to the SSD, well, believe it or not, you can plug a USB-C hub into the USB-C port of the camera to get more ports. Now, this one from Belkins is what I use. I keep it in place using an SSD holder and one of the ports can provide power to the handle and transfer the necessary data, while any of the other remaining ports can be used to connect to your SSD, and I've had zero issues with it in this setup. So there you go. Two hacks for the price of one, and again, if Blackmagic develops a new handle for this, they could easily have the handle itself be its own USB-C hub, because even the zoom demand as it stands has two USB-C ports, though one is meant to daisy chain to the focus demand, but the internal options are already there. Now a few more issues involving recording and playback. Now unfortunately, the Blackmagic Video Assist 
cannot record B-RAW off of the micro's HDMI or SDI output. This makes no sense since the Video Assist can record B-RAW from other non-Blackmagic cameras like the Sigma FP, but not for Blackmagic's actual proprietary cameras. This would be very useful because it means you could theoretically leave the SSD at home and also skip the USB-C hub if you're using the Zoom Demand handle. But for now, that's not the case. Now also, you cannot plug the SSD directly into the Video Assist to play back B-RAW clips off of the SSD in the event that you film something without the Video Assist in place. For example, car mounted work. Again, I hope Blackmagic can fix this. It wouldn't take a whole lot, so we'll see what happens. Now another aspect that might throw a few users is that the G2 only displays ISO as gain or DB boost. Now basically it's the same thing and Blackmagic does have a conversion chart for reference, but as long as you know what DB is and where the threshold is for it to cross over at its dual ISO point, since you can't jump above or below that in post, you should be able to go off of your camera displays and settings. Now once you get the footage into Resolve, it will be shown as ISO. And a helpful trick to remember when filming is that zero DB is your 400 ISO. And each increase or decrease of six DB is a full stop. So minus six DB is 200 ISO, plus six is 800 ISO, 12 is 1600, and so on. Now this display of DB boost only could be something that Blackmagic can potentially change in a firmware update and give us the ability to change what is displayed, just like we can right now with shutter speed and shutter angle. So we'll see if that ever comes down the line. Now obviously the G2 only has one microphone input and it is a 3.5 millimeter jack but you can add a breakout box like the wooden camera A box to your rig and bring in two different mic sources via XLR. Now they will be on just one channel through one input, but you can set it up to keep them separate between right and left. So for instance, if you have a shotgun mic and a wireless lav mic running XLRs into your breakout box, you can have the shotgun mic live in the left channel and the wireless lav live in the right. And once you're in post, you can duplicate your audio track into two tracks and have just one play the left source through both right and left, and the same with track two using the native right, effectively giving you two separate audio input tracks for the price of one. Now, of course, you lose the stereo option and both sides become mono tracks, but if you are in a situation where you're running sound straight into the camera, then chances are this isn't that important given that scenario. If you do need multiple stereo audio sources, you can always record that separately. And once more, this video is being shot on a G2, so what you're hearing now is my shotgun running directly into the camera, so I'll let you be the judge. But lastly, the SDI only outputs a clean feed. Now, coming from a bit of a broadcast background, I totally get why Blackmagic did this, since generally you're gonna be sending the SDI signal to your live view or other switcher for direct broadcast, and you don't want it displaying all of your camera settings. However, given how awesome it is that a camera of this size has SDI and the SDI is preferred for professional monitoring and production, it would be nice if the SDI could display your camera settings. Sure, a workaround here is that most monitors and EVFs allow you to apply zebras, focus peaking, and frame guidelines from the monitor itself, but since you cannot access your menu options when coming from the SDI, it becomes a bit of a hassle to jump over to HDMI just to make a change. And unlike the clean feed from the HDMI, it cannot be toggled on and off. So maybe Blackmagic can change this in a firmware update. Again, it's not a huge deal and a lot of production cameras will be dual monitoring anyway, which the G2 can do with both outputs, but it would be nice to be able to rely solely on SDI for monitoring if you wanted to and still have access to the heads up menu. Now, whatever you might find at fault in this camera, and if the things I've offered up as fixes aren't enough, I don't know what else to tell you. Someone somewhere is always gonna have some issue with whatever camera you bring up. And the fact of the matter is the universe doesn't owe you a perfect camera. Is the Micro G2 a perfect camera? No, but again, no camera is, and frankly, no camera should be. All tools are gonna have their limitations, and learning to work with these limitations are often where the best creative inceptions occur. The G2 is a fantastic camera. It offers a lot of different ways to make use of its beautiful imagery. No, it's not full frame. It's not 6K. If that's what you have to have, go buy that camera. But whatever that camera might be, you'll find that it also has its own limitations. And if you are waiting for that perfect camera to finally get that perfect shot to make your perfect project, you're gonna spend a lot of time doing nothing and feeling frustrated. Now, I for one am very excited about this camera and the prospects that come with it. I imagine Blackmagic will continue to build off of it. After all, they did bring it back to life for a reason. It's a great camera with great potential at a great price, and I will look forward to seeing what it brings to the filmmaking world. 
So with that, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.